Hello and welcome back to Psycho Bible. I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and I've been doing a series of videos just reflecting on back on 2018 and my key experiences. And this one is about going to the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity Conference. Well, that's a mouthful. That was in October in Orlando, Florida. And this video is uh, pretty much a direct follow up to my last video about going to the Restored Hope Network Conference. I've been Reflecting on not just experiences from 2018, but uh, with the Restored Hope Never Conference and the Alliance Conference, it's, uh, it's helping me reflect back on my first time going to those conferences uh, with Re Restored Hope Network. My first time at one of their conferences, and the only other time I was at their conference was in 2015. And that is what led to me getting involved with the Alliance. But first, if you don't know what the Alliance is, let me give a uh, brief description and history of it. So the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity uh, used to be called NARTH, the National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. So I had, I had learned about them when I was early on in college, when I was doing my own research about homosexuality and different forms of counseling for people with unwanted same-sex attraction. I had uh, become aware of Exodus International. I'd already heard about them. And if you read books by people in that field, you also will more than likely also hear about NARTH. NARTH was formed in the early 90s, I want to say 91 or 92, co-founded by this gentleman, Joseph Nicolosi, Ben Kaufman, that's him in the middle, as well as Charles Socarides. I don't have a photo of him. And also in this photo to the right is uh, Joe Nicolosi Jr. So more on him later. And what sets North apart from, say, Exodus International was that uh, it was never explicitly religious in its approach or, or orientation um, or even the values. Uh, it respected uh, the... Uh, religious convictions of clients as well as therapists and, and uh, psychologists, uh, but it would never say that it was coming from an explicitly uh, Christian or religious approach. So, so for, for decades you had exodus for uh, ministry approaches for and pastoral counseling approaches for unwanted same-sex attraction, and then you would have NARTH for uh, for psych uh, psychological approaches, and uh, not quite secular because a lot of the clinicians within NARTH were uh, religious counselors, uh, but not explicitly Christian, like say Exodus, where it was uh, an overtly Christian organization. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap because there's a lot of therapists that are both members of NARTH as well as uh, members of Exodus or part of ministries that are involved with Exodus. So uh, you might be at an Exodus conference and also run to people that are involved with NARTH. And that's the way it was for, for decades. So you had those two organizations. They were complements to each other. They weren't necessarily in competition or anything, just complements uh, to uh, ways of approaching the issue of unwanted same-sex attraction and gender uh, identity issues in, in general. So that's NARTH. Uh, they actually changed their name to the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity in 2014. So just prior to me getting involved with them. I mean, I had heard of them for years. I did not know they had named, had changed their name. However, for, for uh, a few years after the name change, they would still call their conferences the North Training Institute. So they kept the North name for a little while, uh, but they pretty much put it to to bed now. I'm not entirely sure why they changed the name. Um, the Alliance makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a long name. Both were long names. <laughs> but, uh, and I guess also the Alliance is a little more general because now we're finding we're dealing with just sexual identity and gender identity issues more as well. And if with North, the name was just about homosexuality. 
so it doesn't quite make it clear that they address the other issues. So my involvement with uh, the Alliance, or NARTH, as I knew it back then, goes back to 2015, uh, once again, going back to that first conference with Restored Hope Network. As you may recall, if you watched my first video, I was going to this conference, and it was just the, the very day after I got an email from my university where I was a, a graduate student uh, working on my master's in counseling, and I got an e this email saying that I must stop my internship. I was four weeks away from graduating, finishing my internship up and graduating, and I got this email from the head of the internship program telling me I must stop my internship because I learned about my uh, my beliefs and my experience in working with people with unwanted same-sex attraction. Um, like I said before, more to come about that. Uh, but here I am at this conference, fresh with this email, fresh with this huge wrench being thrown into my education and career, and now I'm conveniently, like in by God's design, I'm at a conference with other people in this field who have I'm assuming or thinking they've they probably have been where I'm at. So there was a one of the lunch sessions was a little breakout session for uh, ministry leaders and counselors in this field. So I figured let me go to that and meet some other clinicians and, and therapists and counselors and uh, just get some encouragement and uh, some inspiration as well. And that really is what what led to everything because at that little meeting, it was just a few of us, really, just about four of us in that meeting, I met Dr. Mike Davidson. And yeah, I was going through some some trying experiences right in the moment, but boy, he had he he had gone through the ringer himself. Dr. Mike Davidson, he is from the UK and he runs a ministry called Core Issues Trust, and also he, he uh, has been filming documentaries. He did one on uh, Joseph Nicolosi, and I'll tell a little bit more about uh, one of the other ones he, he finished making. Uh, but he's also... Uh, he's, he, uh, he's also a bit of a, a lightning rod. So he's got himself in some controversy in the UK. Uh, like they bought some ad space on some buses that said, uh, uh, we're ex-gay, uh, once gay, uh, we're here, get over it. And people found that offensive. Like, how dare you say that there's such a thing as being ex-gay? And he has been removed from any professional organization, so he's been blacklisted. Uh, he still runs his counseling practice and... Uh, had to really fight some really bad trials and he just is the most humble and uh persevering and determined man you'll ever meet and you he's so unassuming when you meet him you wouldn't but he's a fighter he really is uh i'm gonna link to there's a video where he was being interviewed by piers morgan and he, you know how piers is he just goes on this relentless attack and he holds his own against him and and does it with great at the same time so he's because I, I did not hear of him before this meeting and now he's become one of my heroes so I really appreciate uh, dr. Davidson and every time I've met him since then like he always shows such like genuine concern and just generally gen, genuine interest in how things are going so I really appreciate that about him um, so as he heard about my story, about what I was going through with my school and how I have a meeting coming up that I, uh, needed advice about and I was preparing for a potential lawsuit against my school or I uh, needed legal representation and just looking for any advice I can get from people who've been through similar situations in this field. So... After that conference, he emailed me and just asked how things were going, and I really appreciated that. So he asked if uh, he was involved with NARTH, even though he's from the UK. 
So uh, he's one of their international members. So he got connect, got me connected with Dr. Christopher Rossick, who is a former president of NARTH or the Alliance. And so we began a correspondence, Dr. Rossick and I, and gave me some advice leading into my meeting. And I told him how the meeting went, and he sent me a journal article that I could use to help uh, argue my case. And so I sent that to the school as well. And then when the school made their decision to terminate my internship entirely and require that I do an entire new internship, which <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. Um, I literally was at the end of this year-long internship. That wasn't going to happen. And so I was like, well, no, they, they picked a fight with the wrong person. So I'm definitely fighting them back on this. And so I was in correspondence with Dr. Rossick, and he's like, would you be okay if I uh, inform the rest of the members of the Alliance? I'm like, sure, I could use any advice and support I can get. And this is just crazy what, what happened. I ended up getting emails and phone calls from some other really big names in the, this this field, like David Pickup. I met uh, him eventually at when I went to one of the Alliance conferences, and uh, he's been a big support. And the probably the most surreal moment of my life was when I got a phone call from Dr. Nicolosi himself. He, and he's the founder of reparative therapy. Like The name gets thrown out a lot and misrepresented all the time, but if you want to know what genuine reparative therapy is, go to his website. Go to uh, josephnicolosi.com, um, and there's more to say about that because uh, his son has been uh, furthering the legacy and uh, changing some of the uh, the lingo use as well. Uh, but that's where you want to go if you want to know what actually happens in reparative therapy. Go to the source. So anyway, that's, that's my advice whenever it comes to this issue. But yeah, that's that was like meeting one of your rock star uh, like heroes here. I'm got this phone call, with Dr. Nicolosi, and he ended up nominating me for the Nicolosi Award for Student Excellence. So uh, they were going to actually fly me down to the uh, Alliance Conference that that October. This is 2015. So I can share my story. However, my lawyers at the time, we're still in the middle of this case. This was going on since the end of June and was not resolved yet at that point. Um, hey, it could have went a lot longer, but it ended up getting resolved by the end of no by early November, something like that. So at that time, uh, my lawyers did not want me making any public statements, so I had to decline. Um, but I, I did actually uh, receive that award with in, in absentia uh, for 2015 and uh, they invited me down the following year 2016 and I came with my wife to the conference in Grapevine Texas so that was my first Alliance conference in 2016 and I got to share my story there so that that was just amazing turn of events here um, I ended up getting this email from my school telling me to stop doing the type of work I'm doing, even though I've, <laughs> it's crazy. I was only working with one client, and it's one I'd been working with for years uh, who had unwanted same-sex attraction. None of my other clients were dealing with that issue. It was just a matter of, uh, it was a value conflict. And so this was a clear case of viewpoint discrimination. So it, regardless, like I said in my last video, this school tried to prevent me from going into this field, and through their actions, they helped propel me even more into it. So, like I said, the joke's on them. It's, uh, I was confident no matter what, whether they ended up deciding in my favor or if I had to go through a lengthy legal battle, I was confident that God would be glorified. And... I was prepared for either outcome, even if it meant I would never graduate, if I would never be able to get licensed. It wouldn't stop me from from working as a lay counselor and continuing the work, continuing the work I'm doing. But thank God it uh, 
it did end up leading me to finishing my degree. I'll tell that story more in depth another time. But getting connected with the people at the Alliance. And I guess I never really thought I would be able to meet these people. I just, they always seemed like uh, I would be too lofty to, to obtain. I guess uh, I read their books. I read their journal articles and just think, wow, these are these are guys up at the top. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to meet these people. And I get to meet my, my heroes. It's, it's been amazing. So whether at the uh, Restored Hope Network or at the Alliance, I'm meeting people. I've, I've read their works and, and uh, integrated uh, their, their wisdom into my own practice as much as I can. I'm still learning quite a lot. And it's just been an absolute pleasure. So that's my my background and what got me involved with the alliance. And um, that that first year that I went, 2016, was also the first year that they decided to start a uh, training program uh, to certify people who attend the conferences in becoming one of their preferred providers. So you would go to the conference and take certain uh, go to certain uh, workshops and you would get credit for them. And even though I'm not yet licensed, I figured let me go to all of these uh, conferences so I can get the required uh, courses so that I can say that I'm, once I get my license, I can get that certification. And it's been really beneficial. Uh, they always have things on uh, research on medical issues, on uh, current and trending topics, on clinical issues. Like uh, genuine clinical training is not just theory, but but showing demonstrations and explaining a little more in depth uh, the techniques they use. So, uh, like uh, my first year, I went. Uh, Dr. Nicolosi was uh, showing a uh, demo and explaining more in depth uh, the latest version of reparative therapy, which is it started off years ago as a, a more relational form of psychodynamic therapy, but it's evolved to be more integrative with uh, trauma-informed therapy uh, and especially with EMDR. He's been sort of uh, merging that with, with uh, reparative therapy and getting amazing results in 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 a shorter time frame. It usually would take at least three years for uh, treatment, and he's finding uh, immense progress within months now uh, using the uh, trauma-informed uh, practices. So it's just amazing to, to, to be involved in the conference. So I would say if you're a clinician or a therapist or a lay counselor or just someone who's interested uh, in this type of work or you're a critic, you're in the opposition, go to one of these conferences. Uh, that's the best way to find out what it is they actually teach, what it is they actually do. They usually have two tracks as well, uh, one track for professionals and then another track for uh, the average person. So lay people, for um, just concerned citizens, parents, uh, loved ones of people with same-sex attraction or uh people who are struggling with same-sex attraction. So you can go to the you know, sort of the, uh, the layperson uh, track or the professional track. Uh, and then they have the keynote addresses that everyone goes to. So it's very beneficial. Uh, I've gone to, this is my, 2018 was my third conference. I'm, I'm excited for the one in 2019. It's, it's, and also it becomes more and more like an, a family. As well as you get to know everyone. Here's a photo from uh, 2017 when we we're in Salt Lake City, Utah, and or to the far left, that uh, Mike Gasparro. In the middle, there's Dr. Christopher Rossick, and then behind him, in the way back, is Mike Davidson from the UK. Uh, over to the right, let me just continue. That's Jim Phelan, and in front of him is. Christopher Doyle, and then you have Pauline and uh, Keith Venom, and Keith is the current president of the Alliance. 
So we all went out to dinner after uh, the conference was over last year, and I got a group photo there. So let me give a rundown of what happened, some key moments at uh, this year's conference in Orlando, Florida. So um, this also was the first year they were doing Facebook Live. You were having uh, David Pickup and Mike Gasparro, two of the board members. They were doing Facebook Live the whole time. They did some interviews. I was one of the people interviewed. Though I'm not sure where the, where the video went, um, and they were just put on the um, the Alliance Facebook group, not their main page. So it's a private group. But if you ask, they're now at the point where they're letting almost anyone join the group. So it used to be a little more selective. It took me a while to get in the group as well myself, but they're way more open now to people joining the group uh, as long as you're uh, joining in good faith. Like you genuinely want to be involved in the community there. If you're going to just be a troll, they'll probably kick you out. So um, that was cool to have them start to get a little more into social media. We really need to do better marketing and get our message out there more. So I'm really excited about that. Also, if you are a uh, current graduate student or a new clinician who's not yet licensed, they have discounted rates for going to these conferences and for membership. So I've been very fortunate uh, to take advantage of that uh, as I'm a struggling new clinician, uh, just trying to get my hours and working multiple jobs to try to get those hours and uh, some of those jobs not paying me on time. So money has been pretty tight. So I, uh, I really appreciate that they have those discounted rates so take advantage of that if you're a student um, and see for yourself what happens at the conferences. This is Christopher Rossick. He's explained the updated version of the uh, practice guidelines and for the Alliance. So if you really want to know what it is that uh, goes on in conversion therapy, or uh, which they don't use that term. That's a that's a farce. That's a uh, that's a straw man. I don't even know what you want to call it. It's a it's a made up term by by activists. But um, if you want to know what happens in actual therapy for people with unwanted same sex attraction, then I would say this is where you want to go. Now these are more suggestions. They're not legally binding guidelines, but they're reasonable and they're pretty much what any clinician I know in this field follows. So if you're thinking that we do some sort of harmful therapy or uh, that we coerce clients uh, or that we shame them, I would take a look at these practice guidelines and see these are the standards and the ethics that we abide by. And I would say you, they're pretty much accepted by everyone in the group. So check them out. They're right on their website. You can go right on their website and go to, um, there's a tab for key documents, and it's right there. Easily accessible for anyone. The Alliance over the past few years has be, been getting more into advocacy, uh, realizing that there's quite a few laws that are threatening our existence, uh, especially considering a lot of the clinicians within the Alliance are in California. And California was the first state to pass a uh, therapy ban for minors. It's, it's a SOCI ban, so Sexual Orientation Change Efforts, which is a, an old name uh, for uh, any form of help for people with unwanted same-sex attraction. And it's legally, they define it as any sort of effort, not just to change the same-sex attractions, but also to change uh, identity and behavior. So it's very broad, and it's not necessarily um, referring to therapy or counseling. It can include things like reading a book or uh, going to a, com a conference or a workshop or seminar or speaking to your pastor. Like what people can consider SOCI uh, is very broad. So with that in mind, the Alliance uh, back in 2016, adopted the term uh, safety, sexual attraction fluidity exploration, yeah. safety, sexual attraction fluidity exploration in therapy.
So that's the term that they prefer to use for uh, actual therapy performed by uh, trained and licensed mental health clinicians. So that way it does not include other uh, non-therapeutic approaches and just say more the ministry approaches or uh, self-help approaches, but it's, it's uh, limited to actual counseling. I have some quibbles about the name uh, because it doesn't address the transgender issue uh, because it's just about sexual fluidity and the name itself does not quite indicate the approach that they're taking with sexual attraction. However, um, at this point, anyone looking for that type of therapy is looking for help in resolving unwanted same-sex attractions. Uh, we're not at a point in society where people are looking to develop same-sex attractions even though they only have opposite sex attractions. Like th it's, that's a crazy idea to think about, but um, it's not impossible we can get to that point where someone may want to uh, increase their same-sex attraction. Like maybe they're, uh, who knows? This is me thinking out, out loud right now. <laughs> so, but I, I imagine a future where if you don't have some, if you're not somewhere on the LGBTQ uh, spectrum or uh, the rainbow, then you'll feel a little left out. And people may want to seek counseling to increase their uh, sexual fluidity toward one of the non-heterosexual directions. So I'm a little bit concerned that that can be that our name can be twisted to use in that that way. Um, but I do like the acronym safety. It does combat the idea that the type of therapy we offer is harmful, because in and of itself it's not. Um, and we need to make that distinction from some of the lay counseling approaches that have been harmful. There's a lot of self-help groups that have been out there or conversion therapy camps like. I don't know a single camp that's out there, but whatever. Uh, I'm sure there's been some really bad counselors in the past. Uh, not saying that everyone who does uh, this sort of counseling has been ethical in the past, but uh, they're few and far between the ones who have been unethical. At least the modern ones. And the horror stories you might hear about, say, aversive techniques are from, like, Generally, they're from the 60s and 70s, and that's because there were some aversive techniques, because behavioral therapy was, was a big thing back then, especially in the 60s. So they used a lot of aversive techniques for a lot of unwanted impulses, and it was, as I say, it was viewed that way. So there's a historical context to look at. Anyway, so... If you want to see what modern-day clinicians are doing in this field, look at the practice guidelines, and uh, that will be really helpful for you there. One of the keynote speakers was John Stenberger from the Florida Policy Council. So not a clinician or researcher, but just an advocate and an ally in, in the work we do. And so he just gave a really encouraging word about, uh, are you willing to stand alone? And I'm just going to go through some of his, he had five main points. In order to have the courage to stand alone, you must be a lover of truth. I love that. This ties into what I've been talking about with Jordan Peterson. It's tell the truth, or at least don't lie. And that has been the principle that I've been living by, and anyone in this field lives by. Like, we just, we will not drink the Kool-Aid of the culture. And sometimes that means we stand alone. A lot of times it means that. Two, the principle of standing alone has nothing to do with rebellion, independence, or rejection of authority. It's not about that. We're not standing alone. We're not uh, willing to stand alone just so we could be countercultural. It's because we're we are in love so much with truth that we know the world will be against us because the world does not love the truth. Three, we will never be truly great in life or history unless we're willing to stand alone. It's those who are willing to stand alone that will end up accomplishing something great. They will stand out. 
for the essence of moral character and leadership is the willingness to stand alone. And five was sort of a two-part paradox. One is that God wants us to be willing to stand alone, but he doesn't want us to stay alone. And then the moment you step out is when people are inspired to follow you. And that's the leadership paradox. First was a relational paradox. So you can see there, there's mention of God. And that is that the, although the Alliance is not uh, overtly a Christian or, or even a uh, religious organization, there are a lot of Christian counselors, Catholic, Protestant, um, as well as Jewish, uh, Mormon, uh, even some Muslim counselors in the field. So there's a variety of religions, and we actually are perfectly fine with, with religious diversity at the Alliance. So that's one that really sets it apart from uh, Resort Hope Network and from, say, uh, the APA or the American Counseling Association, these other mainstream uh, psychology organizations that are not truly accepting of religion. They may be uh, in one way uh, about religious diversity, but when it comes to religious values that go against their narrative, no, they're not. This is Dr. Paul Solons. He's a uh, Catholic priest who is a, a researcher. He was talking about uh, the outcome studies on gay parenting. And then he also talked a little bit about the gay priest scandal. So what I really want to talk about are some of the clinical trainings at the conference this year. What's interesting about the Alliance is they don't hold to one theoretical approach to helping people with unwanted same-sex attraction. That's why they use the term safety to just be a, an umbrella term for all sorts of therapeutic modalities for helping people with unwanted same-sex attraction. And really, you're just using basic therapeutic approaches. Some are narrative therapists, some are cognitive behavioral therapists, some are psychoanalytic, or probably most are psychoanalytic or psychodynamic. Um, most of them would come from the approach of reparative therapy, which, as I mentioned before, is uh, a trauma-informed, relational, psychodynamic approach. So there's a variety within the conference, uh, within the organization, um, when it comes to therapeutic approaches, but most would come from reparative therapy. Uh, but it's interesting to me when there's some of the clinicians who come from a totally different approach. So last year I was talking to uh, Dr. Mike Davidson because he had mentioned before that he does psychodrama, which I didn't know anyone at the conf at the uh, conference or at the organization who does psychodrama. I don't know anyone in general who does psychodrama. It's a very unique therapeutic approach. So I was talking to him like, hey, would you ever be willing to do a workshop on psychodrama? I'm really curious about it. And he's like, oh, have you ever done it? I'm like, no, I'm, that's, I literally know nothing about psychodrama. So I'm curious. I'd love to. I just want to learn as much as I can. And so to my surprise at, and, or delight at this conference, he was doing a demonstration of psychodrama, which was uh, very much hands-on. He didn't even start off with much explanation, just, I need volunteers. And some people were hesitant to volunteer, but I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. I just want to, I just want to jump into this. And he drew an imaginary curtain and everyone else who was not volunteering had to be quiet. And then we just sort of did psychodrama, did it right there. And it was humorous at first. Some of the people knew psychodrama, so they were sort of throwing some some wild cards at him and keeping him on his toes. Uh, but then there was a really genuine moment with one of the attendants who I think was a student as well as a person in SSA recovery himself. And actually he got some some real benefit out of that, that demonstration. It was really fascinating uh, to be a part of it. So... That was one of the trainings we did. The next one was with Christopher Doyle. Now, Christopher Doyle, he runs the Institute for Healthy Families in the Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. And I had actually been following him online for some time. And 
uh, been aware of some of his work, and he does these. Well, he, he's a counselor, an LPC, and uh, he also he runs a counseling practice. One of the main things that uh, is interesting about the work he does is his retreats. He does a like healing the inner child retreat um, at the Resort Hope Network. I was actually talking to some of his clients who were telling me about how how much benefit they got out of those retreats. He has retreats for parents, um, retreats for men to find, uh, just connect with their own masculinity. Uh, So he does individual counseling, but I really love how he integrates the whole family system in his approach. So the conference, he showed us what will be part one of a three-part training in his Healing the Family Protocol. And he was fortunate enough to have a client of his volunteer to, uh, actually all the members of his family volunteer to be filmed as he did this protocol. And he'll travel to your house, your own home. He'll go wherever to do this. It's usually like a, a weekend intensive. And it was very powerful to see them uh, go through the process with him. So that was that was really beneficial. I'm looking forward to the next few conferences to get the rest of that training in. The last training that I got to go to was with Joseph Nicolosi Jr., and he presented on his reintegrative therapy protocol, which is sort of the next step in the evolution of reparative therapy. So he has since copyrighted in reparative therapy so that people can't misuse or misrepresent that name. And then he's he's, uh, sort of advanced it with uh, his model of reintegrative therapy which is not just an approach for unwanted same-sex attraction. Uh, As he makes the point, it's for addiction as well as trauma. And I found this to be true as well when I, because it's really just a continuation of the work his dad was doing with uh, the reparative therapy and the uh, assertion and shame-based self-states, which when I first came across that material, I started using it with my clients who have just uh, pornography and sexual addiction issues. And I took a moment with uh, Joe Jr. doing his uh, workshop to tell him, yeah, actually, I agree. I have I always looked at your dad's model as sort of a linear version of Patrick Carnes' sexual addiction cycle. So I, I usually explain both those models to my clients, and it helps them make sense of it all. And he really appreciated that. So uh, he presented the reintegrative therapy protocol. And as a treatment protocol, he would say it's not so much an all-encompassing approach, but it's a protocol to be used in certain uh, with, with clients uh, and to follow it sort of uh, systematically. And he has an article in the Journal of Human Sexuality about it, and he had a handout with the illustrations and really appreciated that. It was well done. And I had to make sure I got a selfie with him. So another thing we talked about when uh, Nicolosi Jr. was up there was AB 2943. So in between the Restored Hope Network Conference and the Alliance Conference, uh, the proposed bill in California that would have pretty much outlawed any form of therapy or pastoral counseling or conference or seminar or any form of help for people with unwanted same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria got shelved. So the writer of the bill, Evan Lowe, decided not to present it to Governor Brown to be signed. So that, that news broke, I don't know, was a few weeks, I guess, prior to the Alliance Conference. We were all just sort of holding our breath. We weren't sure what was going to happen. And then that news came that, whoa, it's it's not going forward to be passed. But the rationale he gave wasn't that he changed his mind and realized the error of his ways, that this bill would have been too far-reaching and a huge violation of, of client rights and and free speech, just that he believed there's more change that needs to happen within the religious community in California. And so the bill's not quite dead in the water. 
I'm really skeptical about what his intentions are. But he had said that he had done some traveling and speaking to pastors and other people about the bill and before he made his decision to pull it. So it turns out uh, Joe Nicolosi Jr. was one of the people that he spoke with. So I asked him, uh, what did he gather from that meeting? What, what was his assessment of Evan Lowe and what, like, what was he able to learn about why he uh, decided to pull the bill? Was there a change of heart? It doesn't seem like there was based on his press release. And I, uh, Dr. Nicholas Jr. really didn't have much insight there. He's like, he didn't get many answers either. So I think we have a bit of a respite, a bit of a break from the threat that was AB 2943. Now, I'm not in California, so it wouldn't have affected me yet. But California was the first one to pass a therapy ban for minors. And soon after, a bunch of other states passed them, and states are still trying to pass them. 14 states, as well as Washington, D.C., have passed therapy bans for minors. And a bunch of other cities have passed them as well, such as Philadelphia, not far from where I live. And in fact, currently in PA, we have a therapy ban for minors that is in committee. So it hasn't passed yet. It hasn't been up for vote. And it even has bipartisan support. I reached out to the congressmen, congressmen that are involved in the committee for it. And one of them was, I reached out to all of them. And only one got back to me, and it was a Republican. And he said that he supports the bill. And that was all. Didn't want to hear my opinion or my insight. Uh, didn't even answer my question about when they're taking testimony. So uh, they are rushing these bills and not really receiving any true guidance and testimony from people in the field, and that's kind of scary. So we all knew what this meant. If AB 2943 passed in California, it would just embolden more states to do the same. Usually things spread from the left coast to the east, and it just gets worse. So we know that we're always in danger in the work we do. But, um, you know, it almost, there's, like I said in my last video, we almost kind of preferred that the bill would pass so that it can be challenged and finally be brought to light. The public is, only growing the awareness, and they're only hearing the leftist side of these uh, these bills when it comes up, saying, oh, this is how bad therapy is. In fact, it's so bad that 14 states have banned it. So that's, that's the message it's getting out. It's not a message of, hey, 14 states have violated client rights to obtain therapy that, that lines up with their worldview and their values and uh, violates parent, parental rights as well to at least get some counsel that aligns with their, their values. So that's, that's what's, what's going on right now. It's, it's uh, quite alarming, but not surprising at the same time. So one thing that happened after the Restored Hope Network conference and before the Alliance conference was I connected with Stephen Black. After the uh, RHN conference, I was following him on Facebook and he was posting some uh, messages uh, or sort of a live Facebooking the Revoice conference that was going on, which was a LGBT Christian conference that uh, might have to do another video just about that. And so I was commenting on there and Facebook, because I was commenting on his post so much, I guess Facebook sent him a suggestion to uh, add me as a friend. And he got confused because he thought we already were friends on Facebook. I'm like, no, we weren't friends. I, I had just been following you. I'd, I'd never uh, friend requested you. So we became friends on Facebook. And when he realized who I was, he was like, wait, you're that guy at the Resort Hope Network Conference who shared his story. And he like, this is an answer to prayer. I had been praying that God would connect me with you. And so I'm like, well, that's interesting. So he arranged a phone call with me and we talked. And um, so we, we start up uh, some correspondence. And that's just been fascinating. And just really encouraging as well as one of the main leaders in RHN. And um, I'm not going to talk about everything we talked about, um, but just that was really encouraging. 
So I show up at the Alliance conference, and there he is. I wasn't expecting to see him again, uh, just a f literally, a f I guess, four months later. So that was uh, that was awesome. And uh, so I got to have lunch with him, and also there's Denise Schick from uh, Help for Families. They're a ministry that uh, helps people dealing with uh, loved ones who are uh, uh, come out as transgender. Uh, and of course, there's uh, Keith Venom and his wife Pauline in the front. Uh, so he's also a member of uh, Restored Hope Net Network as one of their one of their preferred therapists. And here's Stephen at the Alliance conference. He was sharing his testimony, as well as talking about his new book and the First Stone Ministries Effectiveness Survey. There's uh, Stephen and Denise, and uh, to the right is Peter Sprigg from Family Research Council. And at the Alliance Conference, he was awarded the President's Award for all of his for all of his uh, advocacy work and uh, fighting for client rights. And once again, going back full circle, when I went to that first Restored Hope Network conference in 2015, I just happened to end up sitting next to him and his wife. And and so there's some of the first people I talked to about that email I got from my school. So that was that's funny how uh, I keep seeing him at the conferences as well. Here's Peter receiving the president's award. Another person I met there, and Shane, this photo is a little blurry, but this is Tom Littleton. And when I saw him, you can't see it right here, but he's got a ponytail. And so I saw him like, I know this guy. Because he has a video on YouTube that I used when I was dealing with a situation earlier this year with a, uh, a ministry that I was involved with. Uh, it's a youth conference that I was seeing them going down a pro-LGBT path, which was a very big departure from where they used to be because they actually used to invite me to do uh, workshops about same-sex attraction. So to see them going down this path uh, was just a real affront to me. And I was making an appeal to the leadership uh, and just giving them a stern warning. And I, in one of my email exchanges, or the final one, I uh, attached a, a video on YouTube with this guy <laughs> where he's, he's uh, speaking at a church and he's talking about the strategies of the LGBT movement to infiltrate the church. And he goes into quite really good research on the strategies that they're using to influence the church and convert the church toward pro-LGBT uh, activism. So we got to chatting a lot, and uh, I really, I was quite surprised to see him there. That was awesome. Here I am at the hotel, day one. It's <laughs> first time in Florida, actually. All right, so like I've been saying, if you really want to know what happens in therapy for unwanted same-sex attraction, check out the Alliance. Check out their, their Facebook page. Go to their website, of course, and uh, check out the Journal for Human Sexuality. It's, you can purchase the versions or the, the volumes right there on the website. Get the 2018 version. My, my story is in that that volume and just do your actual research. If you want to know what reparative therapy is, go to Joseph Nicolosi's website. If you want to check out what reintegrative re therapy is, go to Joe Jr.'s website on reintegrative therapy. Just do your due diligence. Don't just go by what the propaganda is saying, that we're out there aggressively snatching up clients and forcing them against their will to change their orientation, that we're using uh, torture or uh, shaming techniques. It's like, you really understand this. They're actually, uh, the main thing we're addressing is shame. Because we understand, at least uh, for the most part, most of our, the therapists in this field are coming from a trauma-informed or developmental perspective. And we understand shame to be the root issue to the same-sex attraction. It's usually a sense of gender inf inferiority. And 
so the, the work we're doing is to reduce shame, not increase it. That's the complete lie that what we're doing is is forcing uh, therapy on people and that we're using uh, shaming of techniques, not among the actual professionals in the field. There may be some like fringe pastoral counselors out there uh, or just some really bad unethical therapists that are not associated with anyone in the alliance. They may be out there, but if you want to know what the actual therapists are doing, check out the alliance. Uh, more than likely, you will be impressed with the level of competence and skill that these therapists have. Um, when I was there for the first conference, I was just really blown away by the professionalism of the therapists in this field. And you think about it, they're coming from a developmental approach uh, to understanding the uh, ideology of same-sex attraction. So, and also not just developmental, but multimodal. They understand that there's probably multi multiple factors that go into the development of same-sex attraction. So if they're going to address this issue, they understand it's going to be multifaceted. It's going to require a very sophisticated approach. They're not simplistic in their approach to this issue. They are very sophisticated. They are uh, multi-skilled. They, uh, multi they have multiple disciplines. And But above all, they have some really... Some of the therapists I met, like, say, Robert Vasso and uh, David Pickup, they have very good clinical instincts. And... The, and I, brush, I rub shoulders with a lot of therapists. My, my main job uh, is working for the largest uh, mental health provider in the state of Pennsylvania. And I used to be the uh, administrative assistant to our mental health IOP and go to their trainings and sit on a, a lot of clinical trainings with these therapists that run these mental health IOPs. And I'm familiar with a lot of therapeutic approaches, and I guess say the therapists in the alliance, I, they know what they're doing. They and they're ethical. They they're not forcing anything on anyone. When they have clients who seem uncertain about their resolve, or especially they have an adolescent, they they're very careful with their adolescents. And they're not making guarantees of change. They're not making false promises. They're uh, they're not shaming clients. They are very careful. They have to be. <laughs> Things are so hostile. Maybe in the old days, there were some therapists who made some grand, uh, some outrageous promises to clients. It's not like that with these therapists. So check out the referral network if you're looking for an actual therapist who does this work. And if there's a therapist out there who is doing, making these broad claims, call them out. And if they're practicing unethically, report them. We will disassociate because we just want good therapy for our clients. That's ultimately what reparative therapy and uh, safety is all about. It's just good therapy where the clients goals are being addressed as the client presents them. Nothing's being forced on the client. So clients ought to have the, the right to obtain the therapy that matches their own worldview and their, their own chosen goals. And that's what the Alliance exists for. And these bans, these bills that are trying to be passed, all they will end up doing is making the situation worse because most of these bans only affect licensed clinicians. They don't touch pastoral counselors, which are usually the ones, I hate to say it, that are doing some of the unethical practices if they're running these conversion therapy camps. It's usually pastoral care counselors. It's uh, Even though the ones who are part of, say, Restored Hope Network, like I said in my previous video, they're doing good counseling as well. There's a lot of overlap like, I was excited to see members of Restored Hope Network at the Alliance Conference. I love seeing that they're uh, integrating sound therapeutic techniques with their uh, pastoral counseling approaches. And that's, to me, the key for the future going forward. We need to have an integration of good therapy 
with these pastoral counseling approaches where you have the word of God, you have uh, leading the Holy Spirit in the therapy session and in the whole way you run the ministry, as well as all informed by just good research and therapeutic approaches. So those in the Restored Hope Network, I'm, I will not put them down one bit, but there are probably some fringe groups out there and some lone therapists out there doing some crazy stuff. And just because you make something illegal doesn't mean people aren't going to seek it out. If you make good therapy illegal, they're just going to go toward what's available. And the only thing available is some ministry or some pastor who says, yeah, I can change your son. I can make him straight. And is has no clue what he's doing. You're making the situation worse by passing these bans. If anything, just encourage good practice, which that's already what we're trying to do. What we see these ban these bans are is just trying to control the narrative through fear, basically. Like torture is already illegal. You don't need to make another bill or ban on torture and therapy. That's already illegal. So if someone's doing torture with the client, yeah, we'll re let us know. We'll we'll join you in trying to get that person to stop their practice. Obviously. So anyway. That is the gist of uh, my thoughts on the Alliance, and I really appreciate that they exist, that they have not given up the fight, and they can use the support. So attend the conferences, um, buy the books, buy the journal articles. Uh, I'm sorry they're not all free. It's hard to pay for the research uh, to support it. So. Do what you can to help out in the field. And hope to see you at the next conference. We're going to be in Phoenix this year in 2019. All right. Hey, if you have any questions, comments, dialogue with me in the uh, comment section. Uh, if you like the video, hit that like button, subscribe. And I'll also provide links to uh, some other things in the Alliance in the description. All right. Thanks so much. So check out uh, Dr. Nicolosi's website. Um, here's also his book. This is his landmark book, Shame and Attachment Loss, The Practical Work of Reparative Therapy. This is what you want to read if you want to know what actual reparative therapy is. So check that out. Um, another book I would recommend, which is pretty cheap, you can find it on Amazon, and that's uh, Successful Outcomes of Sexual Orientation Change Efforts. And this is just an annotated bibliography. This is with James Fallon. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> so he was in that one photo I showed. And this is really helpful. It just gives you a bunch of uh, references on research that was done on uh, therapeutic approaches, a variety of approaches uh, throughout history. Uh, I don't, when did he make this? So up until 2014, different therapeutic approaches. I also picked up Christopher Doyle's new book, The Meaning of Sex, A New Christian Ethos. So this, I'm um, already started reading parts of it. Really great. Um, integrates things with theology of the body in it. So that's exciting to me. And another resource I picked up was Voices of the Silenced. This was the documentary that actually a couple of years ago, Mike Davidson previewed part of it at our conference in 2016. And so he did a screening of the final version of this. It's actually a part one. There's going to be a second part of this coming out soon. And we actually had some students from a local university there for the screening. So that was really cool. And they had a Q&A time with him as well at, uh, before the screening. And he gave them all copies. This is how awesome Mike Davidson is. He gave a copy to each of the students that was there just because he wants to get the word out, and uh, just for free, he gave them out to them. So uh, it's he has stories in there, testimonies of clients and other people he's worked with, other people that are part of the IFTCC, which is the International Federation for Therapeutic Choice.
Yes. <laughs> and so that's a new organization that uh, I believe uh, Mike Davidson founded uh, that the Alliance is involved with as well, or at least a lot of the members of the Alliance are part of that too. And so it has stories of people who've uh, experienced change in their attractions, as well as some theologians, and it all ties it together with church history. It was fascinating the way he did it, where uh, he tied together the early church history and the current uh, sort of gay activist movement. And it's just really interesting how he made those connections. So uh, check that stuff out. You can go to his website. I'll put a link to his website in the description as well.